of books. Most certainly is a gem. So, Janetta. OK, well, yes, this is a gem. And it gives me huge pleasure to be introducing Jackie Morris and James Mayhew. Um, and we're so excited to be publishing the third Mrs. Noah book. Um, and it's such a joy to see what a much loved character Mrs. Noah's become through the books. We published the first one, um, oh, it's up behind me on the shelf, Mrs. Noah's Pockets in 2017. And oh, well done, Jackie. Um, and that was really, I mean, I guess initially that was a one off picture book. I don't think we'd realized where she was going to go, but she turned into such an interesting character. Uh, we couldn't possibly leave her at one book. And so we then uh, we then published Mrs. Noah's Garden. Um, and now here we are with, um, yeah, there's Garden. And now here we are with Mrs. Noah's song. Um, all uh, incredibly beautif beautifully produced and illustrated and, and written. Um, and who knows where she'll go next? Um, I can't wait to see. So I just want to say a big thank you to Jackie and James. They're a phenomenal creative partnership. They just complement each other so well. Um, you know, normally I always think uh, picture books can be even more special when it's one author and illustrator in one person. But in this case, it's not that case. It, it definitely is that they're completely complementing each other on an, in an equal way. So, um, and I also just want to take the opportunity to say I'm so grateful to you both for your support for Otterberry Books as a tiny publisher. You're both big names, but thank you very, very much for, um, for your loyalty and support. We really appreciate it. Um, I, as usual, I want to thank Judith, who designed all three books so beautifully. Um, Gail in sales, Tati, Laura and Jade, our new social media person in publicity. Katerina, who does the foreign rights, and Jill, who makes a brilliant job of the production of our books. It's been a real team effort. And Nikki, thanks to you. I always find your conversations with the authors so, so stimulating and illuminating and fascinating. So um, if we got Jackie back, then um, uh, I'm going to hand over to you, Nikki. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, um, it doesn't escape me that both Jackie and James have the same initials. So to me, that's a partnership that was just waiting to happen. And Janetta, you described them as being big names, but I think big names and big hearts, I would certainly say. So we're going to kick off our uh, conversation. So let me just get Jackie, first of all, into the spotlight. Oh, there's James. We're coming to you, James. Don't worry. You're going to get your moment in the sun. <laughs> uh, but before we uh, get going, um, and before we start to talk about Mrs. Noah's song, Jackie, um, I want to turn to the beginning. Uh, the three Mrs. Noah books, as Janetta said, seem to be a really genuine collaboration between you and James. But where did the idea for reimagining the story of Noah and the flood come from? Whose idea was it? And, uh, you know, the idea for this new perspective? Um, I think um, it started partly because James wrote first for me. Um, we, we were talking one day about um, being illustrators who write and how to get taken seriously as a writer because um, I think the, we felt that the perception of people was that the words are just there to hang pictures on, but actually both of us very serious about our writing. Um, and I said to James, well, why don't you write something for me and I'll, I'll write something for you? And he wrote, can you see a little bear? Which was like such a gift to an illustrator because there's something, when, when you have somebody who knows how to write and how to illustrate, there's such a lot of space left mm -hmm. for the illustrator to step in and fill. And with a book for very young children, I think that's really necessary. Um, you want a book that can be read very quickly for poor tired parents, but you also want one that is like a tapestry that you can really delve into and find other stories and things. So James left space there. Um, 
and I did nothing um, for him <laughs> other than illustrate the book. And then he wrote another one, which was Starlight Sailor, which um, we're hoping Jeanette is going to bring back into print. Um, it would be lovely, actually, to see it back in print. Um, but then I was watching, um, James had done costumes for um, Noah's Flood, the Britain opera. Um, and I, I was kind of watching this happen from a distance, didn't realise it was only going to be one performance in Tewkesbury Abbey. Um, and he was talking to me about the story because I'd seen, um, I'd seen the work he was doing for it, beautiful, beautiful work. And um, he was telling me about Mrs. Noah, the character, and he was saying, oh, yeah, she's, a, she's quite a scold and she's, uh, you know, she, she rarely gets a mention usually, but the mentions of her in, in Britain's opera were quite negative. And some would say a little bit misogynistic. Um, and I wanted to rescue her from the obscurity of history because I think any woman who's going to get onto a boat with a man <laughs> and every pair of every animals in the world she's got to be some woman really mm. um and then it i live in pembrokeshire and it rained and i was walking up a pathway and um the pathway had turned from being a pathway into being a stream and this phrase came into my head um this is my favorite page of writing that I've ever done. It's the start of Mrs. Noah and it just says, it rained. I love the space in that. Such it a good rained. example of yeah. how you've left so much for James. Can I just ask you before you go on though, Jackie, when you wrote the text, yeah. did you know that it rained was going to stand alone on one spread like that? Yes. Yeah, I, I kind of did. I think um, I did with each text. Um, I wrote it, I split it into pages, didn't I, James? But then yeah. it was for James to decide whether he wanted to keep that split or he wanted to change it because I had no images in my head when I was writing it. I had only the pace of the language and the turning mm -hmm. of the page, but that can change when images are added. And in a way, it, it's collaboration. But I think for something like that, the illustrator has more say. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, I, w I wanted to keep it that simple, that much space. Mm -hmm. um, Tell us how it goes on. I'd love to hear a bit more. So this, this is what was in my head as I was walking up this path on the Pembrokeshire coast. So it rained, not the kind of rain that comes in a shower, then passes. This rain came from a sky dark as a bruise, falling hard and fast, beating the earth, washing down tracks, making streams of pathways and rivers of roads. And it was what was actually happening. Mm -hmm. um, the road to my house was just, it was, a, it was like a river. Mm -hmm. um, you have to wade a bit to get to my house in, the, um, in certain times of the year because there mm -hmm. are springs that come up when the when the when it rains a lot and it does rain a lot in Pembrokeshire mm -hmm. so just, it was all kind of born out of the real mm -hmm. I want to say something about the memorability of language uh, because ever since reading Mrs Noah's pockets when I see a dark sky mm, in my head I look it's as dark as a bruise so mm. that phrase has really stuck with me mm, yeah um that's what poetry does, I guess. Yeah, there's a phrase from, there's a poet in Japan who wrote a thousand years ago about the ink dark sky mm. at night. That stuck with me, mm. ink dark. So you wanted to reclaim Mrs. Noah in, in some way, and yet you decided to stick with calling her Mrs. Noah and not giving her a name. She has a name. She, she has knows her name, name but like a cat. She doesn't share it often with people. Yes, she does like the same. Maybe one day she'll let other people know what it is as well. Mm -hmm. But yes, I mean, Mr. Noah is Mr. Noah and Mrs. Noah is Mrs. Noah. So. Yeah, so Noah's their surname. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Has she um, me? I'm not sure. Shall we just bring James in as well? Can we just... Uh put the spotlight on James. 
Uh, James, I wanted to say, I know that we've talked about this before, but maybe we haven't um, talked about it with this particular audience. And you've got a very successful career as an author and illustrator, and we have become very familiar with your painterly style. I think probably the Katie books are in every school in the country. Um, so when I first saw Mrs. Noah's Pockets, I was struck by how different, how adventurous, how playful the images are. I just wonder whether it was obvious to you from the beginning that you were going to work in collage. She says, pretending she doesn't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, the answer is no, it wasn't at all obvious. And actually what happened, I don't know if Janetta knows this story, in, in fact, um, but uh, originally it was going to be a book with Francis Lincoln where Janetta was, was editor and she went and set up her own list and took Mrs. Noah with her and there was a long hiatus while everything was all sorted out, which gave me the time I needed to find out the right way to illustrate the book because um, what Janetta didn't know was that I was actually slightly panicking. Jackie had written the text for me, which is obviously an incredible honour, and, and you've heard some of the poetry of the language. How could you not be inspired mm. by such fabulous, beautiful words? And I really, really wanted to do the best I could possibly do for this book. Um, I'd been frustrated with my work for many years, actually. Uh, I mean, the Katie series ran for a, a quarter of a century. And the problem mm. when you're doing a series is you're always looking backwards because you're trying to keep the series consistent with what has gone before. Whereas over a 25 year career, you learn many new skills and techniques and you want to use those, you want to try them. So I felt rather shackled by Katie and some of the other books I was doing. And to some extent, if I'm honest, by the publishers I was working with. So um, I was very excited about this opportunity to work with a brand new publisher, Otterbury Books, and to find a new way of illustrating something that would bring back all the excitement and fun for me, which I felt I had lost. And it was a, it was a, it was a very difficult time in, in, in lots of ways. And I got very frustrated and worried. And one day I'd, I'd done some painting. I was trying to do something more based in paint rather than just drawing and colouring in, which is what I was kind of doing with Katie. And, uh, and I was very frustrated. I didn't like it. I ripped it all up. And then suddenly on my table, out of the torn pieces of paper was a landscape. It actually became that first spread that Jackie showed with the words, it rained. Um. And I mean, I worked into it a bit, obviously, to, to get it finished. Um, and my, my husband looked over my shoulder and he said, that's it, that's the solution, because he, he knew I was, I was, I was very stuck. Um, illustrator's block, perhaps. Mm -hmm. and, and I said to him, really, do you think so? Do you think I could, think I dare do something that different? Because I recognised it wasn't very, very different to how I'd worked before. I was worried that Janetta was expecting something closer to the work mm -hmm. she had seen. Jackie also, um, but they were both brilliant because um, the magical word for an illustrator is trust. And they both trusted me. Mm -hmm. They uh, were very happy to just let me go off and do what I felt I wanted to do for this book, which was such a gift. And the book wouldn't exist in the way it does with, without them trusting me to, to play and experiment and tear up paper and do printmaking and all the things, which I'll talk about later when we show the slides, mm -hmm. um, and, and find the right way for the book. And it was it was a it was a visceral it was a physical reaction to the work, you know. I was I was creating stuff. When you draw, you have a particular expectation of what it's going to look like, and if it doesn't look like that, you're disappointed. But with collage, you don't really know what's going to happen because everything can keep moving around until you glue it down. And 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 it was like a punch in the solar plexus. It was it was it was a real thrill. It was a oh my goodness, that's really strange, but I like it. It excites me. Mm. And to have that feeling, have that passion about my illustration again, was was just wonderful because uh, I felt I'd got very stale at, uh, up until that point. Uh, well, I had that same thrill when I saw the book for the first time. Um, and I can't believe that you would have that trepidation that Janetta and Jackie wouldn't have that equal thrill uh, when they saw it too. Jackie, maybe we should talk a little bit. Oh, yes, do you want? No, I, I was just going to say, um... When I wrote this story, I'd been kind of brooding on it for quite a while. And it it all emerged one morning, more or less as it is in the book. But I was so scared sending it to James <laughs> um, because I'd already kind of fallen in love with Mrs. Noah. 
and um, I was desperate for him to want to do it. And um, it was, um, what did I feel like? I felt like when, you, when you've done your best work and you hand it into your teacher and you just like, and you're just a little bit scared. And mm -hmm. so I was just so enormously relieved. And I had no idea what, what James was going to do with it. And my delight in seeing this um, emerging, which I think has gone from strength to strength and uh, mm. once upon a tune um, is just so beautiful and so complex in its collage and its pattern and the, the richness of its colour. I just love it. Mm. I think hopefully we will talk a little bit about some of the development, because I think when we do, that's been the joy for me over the past few days is to go back and revisit and read the three books in sequence and to notice new things in the writing, in the character development and in the artwork as well. Uh, and when people do get their hands on a copy, I'd really urge them to look closely and you, you'll see new things come to you. But I think we must introduce Mrs. Noah's song before we go any further. Jackie, perhaps you could do that in your words. Well, Mrs. Noah's song, it is the third book, but in a way, this is just one book that has taken quite a long time to write, I think. It's like the third chapter in a book. Um, it, this one began with a desire to write about music. Um, both James and myself work with musicians and um, seeing how the spell songs people worked had taught me so much about um, working as a group. You know, we, we work collaboratively, but very much in isolation, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. You know, we're in our studios working away, we work in collaboration with editors, designers, publishers, salespeople. But being in a room where musicians are making music together and seeing that relationship between them, the stepping up and the stepping back, the, the speaking and the listening. And at the same time then, on the other hand, seeing um, in the Houses of Parliament, these people who should be collaborating at Prime Minister's Question Time, making a sound that is so ugly because nobody listens. Everybody's point scoring. Nobody's working together. They've got a country in their hands mm -hmm. and all they can do is play stupid games. And I wanted to try and make a book for children that showed that adults aren't all like that, but also um, listening to voices other than humans. Um, and birds have always been my passion. They've flown through my life forever. I can't remember a time when I didn't notice them. Um, so the two things, music and bird song. Um, I talked to James about it because I was trying to find a way in how to do this. And one of the things that he was saying was, um, I'll start this off, James, you can pick it up. Um, I was talking about listening to the dawn chorus, you know, um, we heard it much more in lockdown because there weren't so many cars. People who had never heard it for the, for the first time heard it and they would say to me, it's amazing. And I would go, yeah, that happens every day of your life. And uh, this is the first time you've heard it. You know, we need to get children up early in the morning. So we need to open our windows so that you can hear this sound. And it happens in cities, it happens in towns, it happens in the countryside. So I was talking about this to James and you then told me about when you were a kid. Yes, I have a very vivid memory of when I was about uh, 10 years old, something like that. Um, I, I grew up in Suffolk and we had a, a garden with a huge old apple tree, big enough for a tree house and a hammock. And uh, I woke up one night, I've always been a, a light sleeper, and I wanted to go and sleep in the hammock. I thought it'd be an exciting thing to do because I was very excited about having this hammock. And so I tiptoed downstairs, <clears throat> which I was not really supposed to do. The whole fact it was forbidden felt very exciting. I un unlocked the door and tiptoed onto the dewy grass and got into my hammock and lay there thinking I was just going to have a nice sleep in the hammock. And then the most extraordinary thing happened because gradually as the sky got lighter and turned green, the birds started singing. And I'd never heard anything quite like it. It was just transcendental. It was the most beautiful 
rhapsodic experience. Mm. Uh, it made a huge impression on me as a child. Uh, it just got louder and louder and louder. So many birds joining in. It was just a wonderful cacophony of bird song. It was just, it was upliftingly beautiful. And I've always remembered that really, really vividly. It's one of the memories of my childhood. I've never known how to use it in a book. I've never done anything with it. So when Jackie started molding this book, uh, I mentioned it to her and she very generously, I think, uh, wove it into her words, into her story, making this book, um, I mean, all the texts she's written for me have been an incredible gift, but this one feels particularly special, I think. Mm. Uh, if only we all woke up and sung to the dawn, wouldn't the world be a better place? Yes. Um, um, but again, this one started, um, I had that phrase in my head, Mrs. Noah sings as she sows and she sows seeds and she sows clothes. Was that for this one or was yeah. that for the last yes. one? No, that was, that was this one. Yeah. Um, and when you read me the finished text, uh -huh. on, a, on a Zoom call because it I was made him cry. And I, <laughs> but yeah, she did. I just I cried because it was just so beautiful. And mm. uh, when you're an illustrator, and Jackie, you'll know this, it's just something very special to have a text that you feel that emotional about. Mm. Um, it just makes such a huge difference. It really raises the bar for you, I think. It makes me really want to do the best I can possibly do. I mean, I always do with all my books, but for the but for these books especially, it's just, you know, mm. uh, I wanted to pull out all the stops and really, really, really uh, explore every avenue. Uh, we want to have a look at the pictures in a moment, but just a couple of other things to explore before we get before we go there. Um, Mrs. Noah sings, but it's not necessarily uh, the full throated joy of the dawn chorus. It, it has a bit of sweetness to it. And as you know, this book also moved me. Um, and it is that sort of minor key element within it that I really responded to. Can you take, say just a little bit about that, Jackie? Um, is this about um, that there's, there's in, in the books, there are many layers. And in this one, one of the things that I wove in was um, this thing, you know, when you're a child and you're sad, people, the first thing people will say to you is don't be sad. Um, and then you feel like this emotion is wrong. Um, and yet there are many things, even as a child, to be sad about. You know, you lose a toy. Um, people lose much more than that. Um, and being sad isn't a negative thing. Um, when you remember people that you've lost, to remember them is so good, even though you carry the sadness of loss with you. Um, and it's something that should be celebrated because if you love anything at all, at some point it will go. Um, mm. And it's a thing that isn't faced, it's not spoken about. And what I try to do in every book that I do is put in these layers. So for the child that is struggling with their emotions, it can leave a space for them to step into and open up their hearts and open up their voices and find their voice and their way of speaking. And just know that, you know, sometimes sad is good. Mm. I also noticed when I was reading this time and reading them all, I felt that Mrs. Noah's a constant. She's very self-assured and she knows she knows what she's about. Mr. Noah goes on a bit of a journey. I think he's in very soft ways, he's sort of developed in this book. Well, she didn't marry him for nothing, you know. I mean, she knows him. And she knows his heart. Uh, she's she's a strong woman, <laughs> and uh, I think he's had more space in this book. Um, mm. And their relationship as well. You know, they don't always agree. Um, I think that's another thing in in our society at the moment. People get very polarized. Um, they argue rather than discuss, and they don't accept that you can have two people with different opinions or outlooks 
mm. but they can still be friends mm. um you you don't have to you know you're not you're not always right opinion isn't fact you might feel this way somebody else feels differently there's no reason to have an argument mm. um and if you stop and listen maybe you'll learn maybe you'll change maybe you won't mm. but um they have a marriage that is built on respect um and understanding and not um uh I think she does go her own way in the first one because he's he's not fond of the mythical animals, is he? Mm -hmm. And and she doesn't she doesn't worry about permission or anything. She just goes and she knows that stories are important. They need to be carried through. When you journey, the main thing that you have is your memories of where you've been, um, where you came from, and you carry those through to a new place. And they're a gift to the people that you might meet. So you know, she understood that and, and he knows it too, really. Mm. He just needed her to remind him. So I think maybe we should look at some of the pictures. <laughs> and James, I'm just going to share your presentation so we can have a look um, at them. And uh, I've got control. Can you see the pictures? Yes. I can see the cover of Mrs. Noah's song. Fabulous. Looking very beautiful. <laughs> So, uh, James, shall I just take my cue from you, like before, as to when you want us to move on the slides? Um, yes, and absolutely. also when you would like your musical interlude, if you just let us know as we go through when the time feels right. Um, and we'll just have a nice conversation about the things that you're going to show us. OK, well, we'll keep the musical when I do um, the practical demonstration. Um, mm -hmm. But, yeah, we can we can go on to slide two straight away. Um, we're going to see a few slides now from the production of Noah's Flood that Jackie mentioned. And this was for the Cheltenham Music Festival in Tewkesbury Abbey. Tewkesbury had been surrounded by a flood famously a few years ago. So uh, it was an ideal place to host the story, um, which Britain wrote specifically for performances and community spaces. So it involved hundreds of children. And normally they're dressed and costumed as, as animals. Next slide. Um, but uh, I couldn't give them animal costumes because they wouldn't be seen because of the logistics of the way it was being staged and the sight lines. The children themselves were almost invisible. So I gave them what I called uh, avatars. Um, and these were either medieval, menu, um, medieval banners, which I think you can see in this photograph. So they were uh, uh, actual pieces of cloth. In fact, quilt covers bought cheaply um, on, on poles held aloft. Or they were silhouettes. You can see one silhouette of an animal cut out of foam board. Can we have a look at the next slide, please, Nikki? Um, here you can see me making crowns of birds. These are a pair of swans. So, of course, all the animals are two by two. So I had to make two of everything. Um, it was a huge task. I had to personally make every single piece for this production. There were 250 children involved. It was a colossal thing. It took me ages and it was exhausting. And, and as Jackie said, it was it was for only one performance. So it was kind of disheartening to see all thrown in the skip after the performance. Um, oh. But it was very magical. It was a very beautiful thing to be involved in. And what happened was I was changing my work because I was working rapidly and because I was having to think about big, bold shapes that would be seen from a distance. Next slide. Um, I was having to think uh, in very sort of simple graphic terms. I was painting in a way I'd never painted before. And I was thinking a lot about shape and form rather than line, uh, which is very significant for me as somebody who'd always worked in, in line before. Next slide. Um, so these are some of the birds you can see, all hand painted um, on both sides. It was a colossal thing. Uh, next slide. Uh, more birds. These ones were suspended on poles, so they look like they're actually flying above the ark. Mm. Uh, um, and Jackie Morris has one of the banners she's just written, I see. Okay, next slide. We're going okay. to whisk through these because we'll run out of time. Yeah. So there, <laughs> there you get, there you get a, a broader view of the production. So the ark was shaped like a dove in a nest. Obviously, the dove is very symbolic in the story of Noah's uh, ark, or Noah's flood. Um, there's a storm sequence, and the storm was represented on the sail. The sail was painted to show a mm. storm and was waved about during that piece of music. Um, so I took that idea and used that actually in the illustrations of having a figurehead on mm. the ark in Mrs. Noah's pockets, which was shaped like a, a dove, because I thought that was a really nice piece of symbolism mm. to keep from this production and carry forward. Next slide. 
So uh, this new way of working was part of the part of the background to me creating these collage images for for this trio of books, which uh, I, I am um, I'm, I'm I'm very reluctant to use the word pride and proud because I was brought up to be um, modest, but I am proud of these three books. I think they are amongst the best things I've ever done or probably ever will do. Next slide. So I want to talk a little bit about the technique and here you can see that very first spread work in progress. So I had I'd torn up the paper, I'd, I'd seen a landscape on the table, I decided that was the way forward. I then started drawing in a sketchbook where you can, you can just see it top left to sort of plan some of the compositions a bit, but actually the sketching isn't that useful because once you start cutting up paper, everything changes. So here I was painting a background onto which to place my torn up pieces of paper. Next slide. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually it all came together as that illustration. That's a photo of it before it was finally glued down. So there's some nice shadow there in the photo. Mm -hmm. um, but not much printmaking, which is interesting because what happened subsequently was, um, I, I love printmaking. I love liner cuts particularly. Um, I don't get much opportunity to do printmaking. I'd love to do a whole book in printmaking, never have. Um, but I decided I wanted to introduce some printmaking into Mrs. Noah. So if we move forward to another slide, please. Um, you can see some of the printmaking. So I made just one simple liner cut to begin with um, of sort of a wavy pattern. And I printed it over and over and over, over printing the same print in different colors to get a real richness of texture. Um, and also sometimes on interesting papers like sheet music, you can see there. And what this did was give the illustrations a kind of cohesion. It held the book together. It gave everything a flow. And I used the same lino cut for Mrs. Noah's famous coat with pockets, but also for the sea, sometimes for the sky. Uh, next slide, please. So on to uh, Mrs. Noah's song. I'm still using that same piece of lino. I've still got it for book three. Um, but I've also cut some new lino and I've got some other things. If you look at the tree there, the green tree that's um, just below the centre of that image, um, that's been stamped with, a, with an Indian um, fabric um, stamp, which I bought from a fabulous shop in Norwich called Country and Eastern, which is in a huge, huge old skating rink. Um, it's like a museum, but you can buy everything. It's wonderful. So I buy um, block printing, block printing uh, pieces of wood from there. And I've used some of those in Mrs. Noah's. Um, song and also in garden previously because it's great for foliage and things. Next slide, please. Um, here you can see the image the right way around. So this this is the final image. You can see how messy it is around the edges. It's not all neat and tidy. So I do everything in real life by hand. There's nothing digital about my work. Everything is real, um, and uh, it's quite complicated sometimes to assemble, particularly the smaller detailed things. Things like uh, making sure that the animals show up having the right contrast around them. Uh, things like hands, hands are really fiddly. I can sp sometimes spend hours cutting out the perfect hand only to sneeze and for it to blow onto the floor. And of course the floor by this stage is covered in a thousand and one pieces of paper. So I have to spend the rest of the day on my hands and knees searching for this perfect hand rather than mm -hmm. cutting it again. So it can be a, quite a tricky process, but I absolutely love it. I just love it. Um, next slide, please. And I actually call it my, my Otterberry technique because I haven't so far, I used this technique for any other publisher. Um, this spread was troublesome. This is towards the end of the story. I don't want to um, spoil the plot, but there, there is a dawn and there is a dawn chorus and I wanted it to be um, joyous and resplendent, but I had to include the words. One of the things that's difficult with the collage is it's easy to get carried away and just make sumptuous images and forget that you've actually got to feature the words somewhere. Next slide, please. So it wasn't working. I was trying all these different colours and textures and I was getting very excited about them, but then I realised there was no way the words were going to show up on this. I had to find a space to accommodate words as well as fit in lots of birds and the whole of Mrs Noah's family. So I was <laughs> struggling a bit, but uh, if we look at the next slide, please, you'll see the solution, oh. uh, which looks very, very different. I took away the landscape completely and just had the sun, the birds singing um, and the Mrs Noah family. Um, because actually that's all that was needed. There was plenty of landscape in the other illustrations. So I, I had to let go of that. And that's one of the things you learn. And one of the things you can do with collage is, is uh, you, can, you can change your mind about things and you learn to let go of things. You learn to realize what you don't need. 
Uh, it's sometimes quite hard. Sometimes you get very attached to things, but it's for the good of the book. Next slide, please. I was going to say, it looks to me like you have collaged real birds rather than imaginary birds. It looks like a thrush, a blackbird. Well, it's a mix, you know. I mean, we have a phoenix in the mm. centre, which is quite pivotal to the, to the story, as you'll discover when you read it, uh, for those who haven't. But a lot of the, I mean, smaller birds in the distance are just sort of bird shapes. But the ones in the foreground, um, some of them are taken from the designs I was using all those years ago. It was almost 10 years ago I did this production of Paris Club. So some of the birds in the foreground are, are taken from, from, from the studies that I was doing for the opera. So we have um, the, these curlews with long, or curly with a long beak and, and other birds that you might be able to recognise. Mm -hmm. But others are a bit more um, fantastical. Um, yeah. So yeah, there's a certain amount of sketchbook doodling, but here's an example of why working a mm -hmm. sketchbook doesn't really help because the scene where they're all in the hammock at night, um, the, whole, the whole Noah family, and they gaze up at the night sky and look at the stars and the constellations. And again, I just felt the landscape was getting in the way of what I wanted to show. So if we go to the next slide, you'll see the solution was actually very, very simple. Mm -hmm. um, it's just what they see. This is what they see. It's not us seeing them seeing the sky. It's what they see of the sky. I didn't need to show them. I'd shown them on the previous page. We'll see them again on the next page. We know they are there. They're mentioned in the text. So I wanted to just go and, and, uh, and do something very simple. It actually isn't very simple because uh, creating these very subtle uh, mythological creatures in the sky around the stars was, was actually quite difficult. But I, I think it, it, as a composition, it works much more successfully within mm. the sort of a sweep of the book. Mm. Um, as you know, it was one of the pages that I was going to pick out for you to talk about when we had a chat the other day. It's breathtaking when you see it and you turn the page and it really helps the pace of the book because you're seeing something different. And I absolutely love it. You needed that contrast and it's not analysed. It's just an instinctive thing. You just have a gut reaction. Mm. You just feel that you, you need you need a different sort of a moment or a breathing space in that in mm. the sequence of images. Um, so here we have um, a, the, just before the dawn or the very early stages of dawn in the phoenix and uh, I've included that just again so you can sort of see the mess and the process that's going on mm. and, uh, and, and how I work. So I work on big sheets of paper, these are eventually cut down to size more or less but uh, there's an awful lot of um, mess around me when I'm working on these. Mm -hmm. um, I notice on the hammock you've got that paisley design, but in the book I think it's wave-like, a, a mixture. I think you've got wave-like formations, almost like the sea, as well as the paisley. Yes, so uh, I imagine the hammock would be double-sided and perhaps two sheets of fabric to make it strong enough to hold a whole family. You see, I sort of think these things through. <laughs> And, uh, and, and so uh, in an earlier illustration, there's, there's, a, there's another side to the fabric, which is very wave based because I wanted it to look quite arc like in a sense. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, next slide. So this was um, quite a difficult illustration mm -hmm. to resolve for me. It ended up very, again, very simple. Often the solutions were, were making things simpler rather than more complex. Uh, I wanted a very tender moment between Mrs. Noah and the youngest child. And I also wanted to show something of the interior of the ark that had happened since the ark had landed on the hill in book one. And I imagined that it's made of wood, that it could be carved. And because Mrs. Noah at this point is talking very much about memory, loss, family, all bound up in the subject of music, uh, I thought I wanted to have these symbols carved in the wood around her. Perhaps this is something she's mentioned before. Perhaps Mr. Noah has carved these in the art for her. Perhaps she carved them herself. Uh, I just thought that was a, 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 a nice way of showing an echo of what she was talking about, an echo of, of memory and, and therefore loss. You know, this is a story of a woman, a family who, who essentially are refugees. They've come to a new land. They've left everything behind. So I think it would be very natural very understandable for them want to want to carve um, or create in art somehow memories of their former life and what they've left behind. Mm -hmm. uh, next slide. And on the opposite page to this I wanted again, a, 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 it was a liner cut, but I wanted it to look like it had been perhaps carved out of wood or, or, or something like that. And, and I was wanted to show Mrs. Noah as a child with her mother 
and her grandmother making music because the way that, that memory works in this story is, is through song. That's, that's one of the core messages in the book is that when people travel, when people migrate, um, they bring their culture with them. And one of the great representations of their culture is, is song, is music. So that's what they've, they've brought. They've brought, um, uh, Mrs. Noah has brought a, a memory of her family, of her ancestors, of her history, of her culture through the songs that she remembers. And of course, that's why they're so bittersweet because she misses the peoples that she has left behind. Mm -hmm. um, so on the next slide, we can see um, oh. a, the lino cut that I created. In the end, I printed it on, on sheet music to go with the whole theme of, of music. Um, but this this was the line of, of that's Mrs. Noah as a child in the centre. Um, her mother is singing to her and her grandmother is playing a lute, which proves to be very significant at the end of the book. Mm -hmm. um, I love that sort of midnight blue rather than using black. Yes, I'm, I'm, I have a real problem with black. I don't like black uh, mm. at all. So I, I learned very early on not to use it. Um, so when I'm drawing in ink line, I use sepia. And when I'm printing, I almost always use a, a dark blue. This is a, a Prussian blue with a little bit of black mixed into it. Mm -hmm. Next slide. So oh. that's, how the, that's how the spread ended up. Um, except the sheet music, and um, we made it, we didn't like the blue of the sheet music. This is a slightly early proof. We changed that and made it uh, the sort of yellow of old sheet music that it, that it should have been originally. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how the, the composition balances out. Next slide. Oh, um, there's lots of, lots of liner cuts in the book. Um, some are made very specifically, like this bird, and others, uh, as you saw earlier, are more abstract, like the, the water and the waves and things like that. Um, this is the, um, uh, a print that you can win tonight. It's behind me on the shelf as well. Um, a slightly better print than that one. That was a, a rushed one. Um, so that's what somebody will win tonight. Um, I actually didn't use it quite like that. If we go to the next slide, I think we can see how that ended up, I hope if they're all in the right order. Um, next slide, please. There we are. So I actually collaged um, the liner cut and added a nest because um, the text refers to them being in a hammock like a nest. So I wanted to echo that in, in the little liner cut. So I made a nest and a baby and, uh, and, and cut them out and pop them all together. Wonderful. Okay. I will just say I drew uh, a name um, from the list of everybody who was registered for the event. So if that well person is here at the end, they will win this prize. Uh, if not, I've got some I've got some other names just in case. <laughs> Thank you. So covers are always tricky, uh, very hard. Um, but uh, again, great thing about colleges, you can just keep moving things around. So this is an early stage of the cover. Next slide. I want to race through because I know we'll run out of time otherwise. It's getting closer there. It's almost finished but I obviously wanted to add the crown to Mrs. Noah's head, the flower crown. Next slide. Um, and also think very carefully about where I place the text. That's really, mm -hmm. really important. So I, I sort of cut it out and put it on a piece of paper to make sure I left enough room and didn't have too many birds in the way. Can I just uh, ask, did you design the font that's used on the front cover? No, no um, uh, the, uh, our lovely designer Jude, um, found somebody to do the lettering for us. I'm mm. afraid I don't know their name off the top of my head. <laughs> it's it was, thank you, because it's beautiful. Skill in itself, isn't it? It really is, yes. Next slide. I think we must be nearly at the end. Yeah, I think that's the final slide. So there we are, the finished book with the flower crown, lovely foil on the lovely uh, calligraphy, um, the finished book. Wow. Oh, that was, uh, you got through that very well, James. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I just wanted to ask you a question before we, we see some live art. Um, we had a little conversation the other day and I did say that your images reminded me of sort of late medieval, early Renaissance art, the patterns, the way that they sit on, you know, on clothing, on costume, on tablecloths, has that feel to it. And also the side on view, the processional kind of images. But when I was looking through the three books, I was getting all sorts of connections firing off in my head. Um, I, I was put in mind of Picasso when I was looking at your mythical creatures. I was put in mind of Rousseau and his sleeping gypsy when I was seeing Mrs. Noah uh, in the garden. And I just wondered whether you see those connections. And if you do, are they conscious or subconscious? 
Uh, I think it's a mixture. Some of them are, are, are conscious, definitely. I mean, the, the, the origins, the, the Noah's Flood opera, um, those images were very much based on, on the images I saw in medieval churches, because the text of the opera is a 13th century miracle play, the Chester miracle play. So I was very aware of, of the roots of the story, and, and I wanted to try and capture something about church art in, in those designs. So I think that uh, an echo of that has followed through to, to the Mrs. Noah books. Um, I love Italian art. Uh, I, I, I love um, Renaissance, but also early medieval Italian mm. art and the sparseness of the images and the strangeness of the compositions. So often there's odd perspective on tables and things, which is definitely a reference to that sort of thing. That is a, a conscious reference to, to ancient art, I suppose you could call it, or very old art. But other things, I mean, it's interesting what you said about Picasso and the mythological preachers. I hadn't really thought about that. Uh, but now you've said it, of course, I, I can see exactly what you mean. I think it's because of, of the nature of the medium using the collage. It's quite sculptural. Um, and it has a certain sort of cubist quality because of, of the sort of block printing that I'm using and the cutting up of shapes. Um, um, I didn't see the, the, the Rousseau connection to, to Mrs. Noah sleeping in book two, but that's very interesting. I think having done the Katie books, obviously I, I, I love art, I love gallery art, and I've got, got a sort of um, a reasonably broad knowledge of it. So I think all those things inevitably filter through without me even noticing. Mm. It's, just, it's, just, it's just part of my, my visual library of, of reference points. And that's what we will all do as readers. You know, other people will have connections to other things that they recognise. Um, uh, uh, and it's just part of our, our shared consciousness, really, because we've seen those images. Um, are we going to are we going to see you do some real live art? Well, well we can try. I'm going to try and swivel my iPad round. So okay, I'm going to turn back. Jackie and I off for a moment so people can see you nice and big, um, if that's okay, just for a minute. See the button. Turn the camera around. So now you should be able to see this paper, hopefully, not too wonky. I'm on the moment I can see the ceiling. Oh, yes, I can see the paper. There we are. So on here, if it comes into focus, I'm going to try and create a very quick collage. So what I've done is I've actually prepared a piece earlier of paper because one of the things I like to do is not work on plain paper, but work on a background. I think it really, really helps. And Would you like me to play the music, James? Yes, so I'm not going to talk. I'm just going to, we're going to listen to a, a folk song. Folk songs are wonderful. This is a Spanish folk song. It's a very sad one um, about a, a, a child. It's a, a lullaby from Seville, a child who um, looks like a turtle and hasn't got a mother and whose father won't make a cradle for him. Um, but uh, as I was saying, songs, folk songs have travelled like refugees. So I think listening to folk song was something that I, I was doing a lot of when I was making this book. So if you play the song, I will start cutting up paper. <laughs>
gosh, James, you timed that to perfection. Well, I try. Yeah, I've got to try and turn the camera the right way around again. I'm just looking at comments. I could watch and listen all night. This feels so magical, so absorbing, wonderful. It was utterly enchanting. Uh, Jackie, do you enjoy watching other people create live art like that? I do very much. Um, yes, I love watching James. I know I was at um, Tamsin Rosewell's house once and James made a blue fox with three tails. And it just it was just fascinating seeing where it came from and how. Um, and it looks so quick. But what people need to remember is um, how old are you, James? <laughs> old enough to know better yeah so you know for me um when i paint an otter it takes the length of an otter spell but it's also 60 years of working behind it mm. um it's you can't you don't you you learn how to do it through experience so it's amazing mm. can mm. i just say i've got a bit of an unstable internet connection so i'm hoping i stay with everybody yes please do tell I've that internet <laughs> Yeah. we're doing okay <laughs> um in a moment i'm just going to invite people to ask their questions in the q a box i can see that we have a couple already so i'm going to go to those in a moment uh but james i know that you listen to music and that spanish folk music is absolutely glorious but you listen to music while you're creating art and i think you might be producing a playlist of what you listen to when you were creating this book is that right yes i am going to do that i haven't done it yet but that's on my list of things to do um obviously i listen to a lot of classical music uh, for once upon a tune that was that was the whole idea behind that book but um when i was working on this i was i became particularly interested in the whole idea of folk song and how these songs as i said earlier have traveled um and i discovered all sorts of interesting things about spanish music in particular I mean, obviously it's a very rich culture with the Moors and, and the Jews, and, and those influences can be heard, I think, in that song we just heard. Flamenco comes from Mughal India, believe it or not. And I love the fact that uh, a culture like Spain, you know, we listen to a piece of music, we think, oh, that sounds Spanish. And then we realize that actually it's a mix of all these other amazing cultures, all these people who've migrated and brought their culture and their song with them. So I, I listened to a lot of folk song. Um, I was very inspired by Jackie kindly inviting me to the, to the premiere of Spell Songs at Snape here in Suffolk, which was an, uh, a really enchanting evening, um, modern folk song. But I'm also really interested in old traditional, um, really old folk songs. Um, there's a Spanish singer I love, Victoria de los Angeles, who collected and recorded lots of them. And the recording we heard, um, I was recently in Spain teaching a course and uh, in illustration and at the end of the course I was invited to work with a, a Spanish folk singer called Ana Maria um, Jimenez and, and she was just wonderful and painting to her singing. Um, she sang that song and several others um, arranged by Lorca, the famous poet. Mm. Um, it was just the most magical thing because I, I love that sound well, I love those, those songs, they're so beautiful, they're not well enough known. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, that's what I listen to. And that's the sort of thing that will be on the playlist. Um, Fabulous. We've been joined by a cloud leopard. <laughs> we but, have. <laughs> um, I, I took a snow leopard and I put it in the wash. And this is what <laughs> happened. Um, this is Spit. The Lady Spit of her silver storm for long. So I'm going to start with Sophie Anderson's question. Hi, Sophie. Sophie wants to know, will there be more Mrs. Noah after song. Is it a three act or a five act play? <laughs> she didn't say that, by the way. She just wants to know if there's going to be more. <laughs> I think Jackie um, needs to answer that. Well, at the moment, um, she's taken herself off for the evening with her lute and she's sitting in a dark forest, in the middle of the dark forest, practicing a song for somebody. Um, she tells me her stories slowly, so um, I'm hoping more of this comes. There is something in it that I know already, um, which is like a reversal of a very traditional story. Mm. But um, I, I'm keeping that bit to myself. Do you mind not biting me, please? 
Thank you. I, I must say that it feels very theatrical, you know, the the whole sweep through the three books. And it could almost go back to theatre. I don't know whether that's something oh, that you've funny thought about. You should say that, young Nikki, <laughs> because we are allowed to say today that. Uh, she may be going full circle and we're in negotiation at the moment but we can't really say more than that other than so excited just so excited we will listen to see what happens there could be yeah. very exciting well hopefully we'll have news uh soon um that we can let out let the cat out of the bag uh, another question here, which uh, I think is really interesting, um, from Jane Newbury, asking whether, uh, this is for you, James, I think, but Jackie may have a view on it too, whether there's a relationship between musical keys and specific colours. Oh, well, I, I, I have a passing interest in, in synesthesia and the whole idea of sound and colour. I don't think I have that condition. Um, I think for me, it's just a very instinctive thing. I think it's um, what feels right to me and in the hope that it will feel similarly right to other people. Certainly there are obvious things, certain um, sounds, certain instruments like brass instruments suggest sort of bright gold colors and, uh, and other instruments, more subtle or subdued sounds might suggest a, a duller color. So there's, a, there's an obvious element to it, but I think for the rest, it's not something that I analyze. It's not something that I'm conscious of. Uh, it's just uh, a personal reaction to mm. um, music or in, also to text actually, because text can be very musical too. So mm. I think text brings out colors in me in the same way that music might do. Mm. Do you have a, any thoughts on that one, Jackie? I quite often have the blues, but then don't we all these days? Um, <laughs> oh, very good. <laughs> and, um, no, I, I have that um, thing with with words. I, I want them to fit in the ears like music, mm. but also taste good on the tongue. Mm. Um, so I wander off into other senses as well. Um, I have to say I love the smell of books. I didn't catch that. Um, I love the smell of books. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. A uh, question from uh, Kelly Marshall, uh, two inspiration questions actually, so I'm going to ask them as one question um, and you can decide which you want to answer. So what books inspired you when you were children and what music inspires you? You going first James? Uh, I can do, yes. So um, up on my shelf here I have my collection of Moomin books. So they were a huge inspiration to me. Tove Janssen was brilliant, both as writer and illustrator. So those were real favourites of mine. Um, I mean, there are many others, but I don't want to take up the whole evening. I'm just looking at my bookshelf and glancing around. Um, the Arabian Nights um, with Edmund Dulac's illustrations. Um, mm. That's what led me to Scheherazade and Rimsky-Korsakov, um, which I used in Once Upon a Tune. It all comes from I love of Edmund Dulac's illustrations. Um, I didn't necessarily have these books at home. They were books I took out of the library. We didn't have that many books at home. We had ladybird reading schemes and things like that. Mm. Um, but yeah, um, the Moomins and Tuva Janssen were, were, were the really, really big inspirations. And I think also um, people like John Birmingham. One book I did have was Chi Chi Bang Bang, the mm -hmm. original with John Birmingham's uh, fabulous illustrations. And um, Brian Wildsmith. Um, mm. I didn't have this book as a child, mm. but I saw it and, or one of, this is a, um, several books amalgamated, but I saw his work as a child and just thought it was fabulous. Um, mm -hmm. So th those artists, those illustrators that used amazing colour like Birmingham and, and Wildsmith, they were a big inspiration. Uh, in terms of music, uh, from a very early age, it was classical music. Um, my parents had an LP of Scheherazade with Edmund Dulac's illustration from the Arabian Nights on the front cover. And I just wanted to play it because I loved the illustration. And that was it. And I was swept away by the music and fell in love with, um, with, with Scheherazade and 
and the story in the Arabian Nights, Rimsky Korsakov and many other composers led from there. So um, yeah, it's, it's always been classical music for me, really. I mean, I, I like other stuff too. I like the folk song I've spoken about um, and lots of other things. I mean, I listen to a whole huge range of stuff, but um, yeah, the, the core for me has always been classical music. Um, yeah, particularly music that tells a story. Any kind of music that tells a story is gonna work for me. Jackie. I always liked sketchbooks with blank pages. Uh, wasn't much of a reader when I was young because I couldn't. Um, so I came to reading much later, but um, I used to go to the library and take out a big book, which was called The Jungle Book by somebody called Rudyard Kipling. And I used to look at the pictures and mm -hmm. kind of try and make up the stories that went with them. And then when I did catch the trick of it, it was Talk of the Otter, which actually I've tried reading recently and it's got the most complex language in it. It's like mm. a long prose poem, really. Mm. Um, and uh, Call of the Wild. And um, uh, the, the book that I remember most from my childhood is the AA Book of British Birds, which has the tawny owl on the cover um, and nothing else, no title and no um authors because there were a lot of contributors um i guess so and and i guess I've, that's partly what gave me my yearning for having um book covers with no words on just yeah. images yeah because i do i do think um in a way when you're buying a book you're not you're not necessarily looking for um the author certainly as a kid you know kids don't know they don't even know the books are written and illustrated, they just are. And if you can pull their heart with a picture, I think that's so much more powerful. Um, you know, they don't care if it's written by me or James or, or who, um, not until much later. And, you know, then you hope that you, you grow a readership and people who look out for your books and um, mm. that's lovely. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's not us that matters, it's, it's the work that we do. And um, kind of we, we try to work with, um, well, uh, James, am I speaking for both of us? Beauty and integrity is what I'm aiming for. Yeah, absolutely, yes. Totally, yeah. 100% agree. Yeah, and then music. Um, I mean, I didn't listen to much music when I was a kid. My dad had a, an old stereogram and they had things like um, paint your wagon and um, old, you know, musicals and um, he used to listen to Dean Martin and things like that. And uh, so it wasn't really until I went to college and heard The Clash, <laughs> my head kind of exploded. It was just wonderful. It was just ah, amazing, very different. And now I'm, I've always been very folk songy because you learn a lot of history through folk songs, um, learn a lot about poets, um, so yeah, much later it was it was people like Leon Russellson and Dick Gochen and uh, or oh, Ewan McCall and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so a lot of lot of folk songs. Wonderful. Um, well, what we're going to do now, because we're in the last few minutes, I just feel we could probably have gone on for another hour. Uh, we're just running a little bit over, so to be fair to everyone else, I'm just going to pull it to together. Um, we're going to announce the person that I've got written down here that was drawn out of a hat earlier if they're still in the room and then Jackie I wonder whether to end whether you would uh, read a little bit after I've done that a little bit of uh, Mrs Noah's song and then we might play ourselves out with some bird music at the end. Um, the, the, I've got a slight problem in that the book is under the cat obviously oh. um, but I'll, I'll try I'll try and um well, maybe by the time we've got the winner of this, yeah. we might have retrieved the book. So um, let's have a bit of a drum roll. And uh, the winner of James Mayhew's Lino Cut, if you are still here, is Helen Morgan. So can you make yourselves known in the chat if you are still here? So that's Helen. Can I just double check down at the bottom of the chat? Are you here, Helen? Oh, sorry, my scrolling's not working. He says yes, she, she is. is here. And oh, you. she is. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Nick, so, Nikki, 
Nikki, yes. would you like to choose a second person? They can have the collage. <gasps> okay, well, I'll, I will go to the second person that was on my list then, because that's the fairest thing to do. And that was Sarah Deakin. So, Sarah oh. Deakin, are you there? You can get I, Can I just say thank you to Sarah Deakin for the nest? It's in my freezer. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, is Sarah still here? I can't see. Yes. yes. Okay. So there we are. Those are our two winners, and um, I will sort out um, addresses. If you could email me, uh, Nikki at justimagine.co.uk with an address, and I'll pass those on to uh, James. And now maybe we could end with just a reading from Mrs. Noah's song. Shall I read the whole thing? Why not? If every why not? Okay. It won't take that long, will it? So if, um, if you're bored, you can go. I won't be we, bored. We won't, we won't, <laughs> we won't keep an eye on you. Okay. So I've I haven't done this before, so this is a world premiere, okay. Mrs. Noah sang as she sewed, and she sewed seeds and she sewed clothes. She loved the musical sound of her old sewing machine. She loved to sing. Mrs. Noah sang to the children when they woke in the morning. She sang as she worked in the garden, growing flowers and growing food. She sang lullabies at night to help the children sail into sleep. It seemed to the children that Mrs. Noah never slept herself. She was always busy. The morning songs were full of life. Evening songs spoke gently of the moon and stars. Mr. Noah would listen to her songs and smile. He thought she could sing so sweet, she could charm the birds and the trees. One day the children asked her, where did you learn to sing? Far away, said Mrs. Noah, far away and long ago. And she looked sad. And then the sun shone through the window of the ark, calling the children away to play. And out they ran, all but the youngest child, into the adventures of a new day. Why are you sad? asked the youngest child. I was remembering my mother, said Mrs. Noah, far away and long ago. She taught me so many of the songs I sing to you, and my grandmother also. Mrs. Noah picked up the smallest child in a big hug. Sometimes, she said, sad can be good if you miss someone you love. Mrs. Noah smiled a sad smile and together they went outside to greet the day. Mr. Noah watched from the window. He'd heard the conversation. The garden had grown so much, the trees and bushes, but he could always tell where Mrs. Noah was. Her pockets were deep and full of bird seed. Flocks of birds followed wherever she went, a small escort of winged things. And besides, there was always her song. Listen, said Mrs. Noah to the children. If you want to learn how to sing, first you must learn how to listen. Close your eyes now, tight shut, and open your ears wide, wide. In the garden, the children were silent, standing as still as statues. At first, they could hear nothing. And then, a bird sang. Far away, another answered. Bees hummed as they flew from flower to flower. The wings of dragonflies rattled. A warm breeze moved across the land, and where it passed the leaves, they sang and danced. On the edge of it all, they heard the sound of the sea. The youngest child laughed, full with the joy of it all. I can hear the garden singing. Mrs. Noah smiled. If you really want to hear the garden singing, she said, you have to get up really early. Tomorrow I'll wake you before the sun rises. When she told Mr. Noah her plan that evening, he said that he had a better idea. Mr. Noah took out Mrs. Noah's sewing machine and began to stitch while she watched. Using material he'd been saving for curtains, Mr. Noah made an enormous hammock with ties at the ends in beautiful colours and patterns. He tapped and he stitched and he tucked and he turned. Mrs. Noah sang along to the sound of the machine, intrigued. 
It's a beautiful evening, said Mr. Noah, and tomorrow is a special day. He put in the last stitch, cut the thread and went out into the evening light. All the children and Mrs. Noah followed him. Together they climbed the trees, knotted the hammock with sailor's knots tight to the branches, then all poured in, snuggled under the blankets like birds in a nest. Mrs. Noah sang songs her mother had taught her and they listened to night fall on the wings of bats. Somewhere a fox barked. One by one the stars appeared. Eyes grew heavy as Mr. Noah told them stories about the patterns and shapes in the stars. An owl hooted, was answered. One by one, the children fell into a deep sleep. I love you, Mr. Noah, said Mrs. Noah. Mr. Noah smiled, listened to the music of the stars, drifted into sleep. They woke in the dark, warm in their nest, so quiet as if the garden held its breath. Then a bird sang. Listen, said Mrs. Noah, the phoenix. One by one, birds added their voices until the garden was filled with music and it seemed as if the sun was lifted into the sky on their song. Mrs. Noah smiled to see the children's joy at finding the dawn chorus for the first time. <laughs> hey, sweetie. Ah, <laughs> does this happen every morning? Asked the youngest child. Yes, said Mrs. Noah. Every morning, a wild song to raise the sun. Will you teach us to sing? The chorus of children asked. Like your mother taught you. Mrs. Noah laughed. I will, she said. Songs are best when they're shared and sung together. And Mr. Noah smiled at the delight in her eyes. Happy birthday, Mrs. Noah, he said. I do love you so. Mm. You made her something special because Wonderful. of her birthday. Jackie, thank you for the most perfect bedtime story. I'm echoing the thoughts of... Um, people in the chat who've said exactly that same thing. Uh, and it goes to show how the words just, you know, everything that James was saying about the words and the musicality um, and how they work on their own. Of course, we love to see them with the pictures, but you can just listen to those words and they weave a magic too. So thank you. So, thank you both so much uh, for a wonderful evening. We are wishing Mrs. Noah and her song all the best as she is published. And I will just remind every, everyone who's here still, if you would like to pick up a copy uh, of Mrs. Noah's song from us, uh, you can get one from Best Schools, no, bestbooksforschools.com. <laughs> However, uh, you may well have your own independent bookseller that you want to support. Um, Thank you both very much. Thank you, Janetta, for inviting me to host this event again. And uh, good night, everybody. Thank you all for joining us. And we're ending with some bird song. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> good night. Good night. Thanks, Jackie. Bye. Bye.